Good, good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of the McLean Center for Clinical and Medical Ethics, um, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's lecture in our seminar series on ethical issues in end-of-life care. Uh, next Wednesday, um, here in P117, uh, Dr. Dan Brauner will give a talk entitled, uh, Welcome to the Cardiac Arrest Paradigm. Now it's my absolute pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Mark Kachevsky. Dr. Kachevsky is the Michael J. English, SJ, Professor of Medical Ethics, the Chair of the Department of Medical Education, and the Director of the Neiswanger Institute for Bioethics and Health Policy uh, at Loyola University of Chicago. Mark has also served as President of the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities, the ASBH, which is the leading bioethics organization in the world. Dr. Kashevsky's major areas of interest include the just and equitable treatment of immigrant patients, the role of culture and spirituality in decision making, and bioethics education. Dr. Kachevsky is a member of the Hastings Center Advisory Board on the Undocumented Patients Project. He served as the project manager to help revise the admissions policies of the Loyola University Chicago Stritch School of Medicine to include DREAMers. The DREAMers are individuals who meet the requirements of the Development, Relief, and Education for Alien Minors, the so-called DREAM Act. Um, it's a complicated set of criteria, but DREAMers are undocumented immigrants who came to the U.S. before the age of 16, have been here for at least five continuous years, are under 35 years of age, and have graduated from high school or have earned a GED or served in the military. Loyola Stritch, uh, under Dr. Kachevsky's leadership, is the first medical school in the country to welcome applicants from DREAMers. Uh, in his, and, and I'm told by, by Mark that seven, seven uh, of these applicants are in the current first year class uh, at Loyola. In his work in bioethics education, uh, Mark's experience in providing resources to support ethics committees in community hospitals led him to explore online education. Uh, as you know, Loyola has created two of the major online graduate, graduate programs in bioethics. Today, uh, Dr. Kachevsky will speak to us on the title you see behind me, I Will Never Let That Be Okay Again, Medical Students' Reflections on Caring for Dying Patients. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Mark Kachevsky. Thank you, Mark. Well, thank you for that um, kind introduction. Uh, I'm Mark Kashevsky, um, and it is uh, an honor to be here speaking at the McLean Center, and uh, a real pleasure to have a chance to talk with you today about a um, fairly modest study that we did a couple of years ago that's been published in Academic Medicine. Um, and it was part of a larger project that was organized by the George Washington Institute for Spirituality and Health out of Washington. Um, and it involved six medical schools um, and we came together to try to figure out a little bit about whether there were competencies uh, that one could define for uh, medical students that they would have to achieve in, uh, in, in terms of spirituality, in terms of the spiritual care of patients um, that they attended to during their education. Um, and, the, uh, and through a, a kind of process in which they did focus groups and so on, um, we, they, we came up with some general competencies. And then each school came up with its own specific project under that. And, um, we ended up doing a, a, a modest study in which um, we had our medical students writing about their experience of caring for a dying patient and analyzed um, their reflections on that to um, really look at what that experience was like, 
um, what the clinical setting looks like to them when they care for dying patients, and how they're affected by that. And so um, we, tapped at, we tried to tap into this world of spirituality. And by spirituality, um, it's defined in the broadest uh, possible terms. It's really uh, about meaning-making activity by the patients and by the caregivers. And so um, really looking at how patients and caregivers um, understand the processes they're going through, this process of uh, illness, um, treatment, um, and in the, these particular patients' cases, um, the dying process and death, and how they see that in terms of um, what's going on around them and the transcendent, ultimately, spirituality suggests that bigger picture. And so, um, so when we say spirituality, we're not necessarily talking about religion, but in, in those more general terms. Um, our project at Loyola that, that we worked on, um, we, we, we called our Significant Death Project. Uh, you know, we wanted to ask the medical students, our first idea was to ask them about the um, first death of a patient that they dealt with. Uh, but that didn't necessarily always turn out to be an easy question to ask people because they may have dealt with death prior to their third year clinical rotations. And, and we are talking about third year medical students here. Um, and, or the uh, first death that they dealt with on the clinic floor may not have been significant. They may not have been extremely engaged with the patient. So we asked them to, uh, to write about a significant death that they encountered of a patient on, on the clinic floor. Um, it, it was a multidisciplinary team from our school that engaged in this. Myself, um, as a bioethicist who's been trained in philosophy prior to be, being in bioethics, uh, Michael McCarthy, who's a, a theologian, um, and a physician, Dr. Aaron Mickelfelder from Family Medicine. Um, and as you can tell from looking at that lineup, uh, we were probably going to be hopelessly methodologically clueless. So the publication ended up with three additional people who were our methods people that we added partway into this to um, help us bring this to um, something that could be explained to the public. And so we simply asked them to, the, the third year medical students, during that year they're on their uh, clerkship floors, um, that during that year they should identify a patient that they cared for who died and whose death was in some ways significant for them and write a reflection on that. And then we did content analysis together for themes through a multi-step iterative process of outlining the themes and uh, coming to some agreement on this. So it was, it was strictly uh, qualitative. There, there is not a quantitative dimension to this study. Um, and I should say that the, uh, the task was given to the med students at the beginning of their third year. So by October, they were already well immersed in this process, and they didn't turn this in until May. So they had the full array of clerkships under their belt by the time they turned this in, so they, they could have chosen it from any service that they, that they were on. Um, and I'm going to give you the literal words that we told the students so you'll know what, what the prompt was that we gave them to which they gave these responses. And so we said to them, please tell us about your experience in caring for a patient who died. Your paper should focus on your personal experience of this patient and all the people involved in the process. We also hope that you will tell us about the ways in which you and the other members of the healthcare team took care of the patient and his or her family's spiritual needs. And we went on to say, consider telling us about issues that were important from your perspective. This might include matters of communication. Um, the underlines in bold were not in the directions we gave them. I'm just putting that for our emphasis. So you could see some of the competencies that uh, came out of the George Washington study. The ways in which the particular caregivers did or did not demonstrate compassionate presence the extent to which the patient and patient's fam family's spiritual needs were evident to, assessed, or addressed by the caregivers. Share any insights regarding the spiritual needs or resources of the members of the healthcare team, including yourself. Please close your paper with a discussion of how this experience has impacted how you care for yourself today and or how this has influenced your care of patients if at all, okay? And again, the underlining and, and, and boldening are not, were not in the original directions. But, what I was, uh, but, but why we put that in was to show you that we were really asking them, the prompt was designed to get at four of the six competencies that were outlined by the six uh, GWISH schools in the initial project. And the six competencies that GWISH put out, is, and they published in a, a, an accompanying piece in academic medicine, include patient care, communication, compassionate presence, personal, professional development. And then the, the ones we did not try to prompt for 
were healthcare systems and knowledge things, uh, knowledge, things like um, the difference between religion and spirituality, the difference between a spiritual assessment and a spiritual history. None of those knowledge kinds of things were prompted. We were really looking at the experiential dimensions of their caring for the dying patient. And so, because um, I know in, in, in medical center, people often have to leave very early in this. I will, um, I'll give away the punchline. Here's, here's what we ended up finding as the salient findings from this, this uh, qualitative study. Basically, it is a mixed report on how well we're doing in caring for dying patients out there. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, when we're in conversation, you hear people in frustration say, oh, nothing's changed. Everything's just as bad as it always was. We're not doing a great job at the end of life caring for patients and certainly not good at caring for the whole person, just the, the medical stuff. Other times you'll hear people really coming from the other end of the spectrum saying things are completely different than they were 30 years ago. It's night and day, right? And the answer, for according to what our students were telling us, is that actually it's somewhere in the middle. That it's not, uh, it, it's not that we're not doing well at all. Some people are doing very well. There are, there are, uh, they're, they reported on some role models who were just fantastic at knowing how to modulate their approach to patients, how to deliver difficult news without um, beating them over the head with it, but yet how to be truthful and supportive all the time. And they told us about these kinds of role models. On the other hand, they also told us that sometimes it is like it was 30 or 40 years ago where nobody actually brings up the subject of dying and that there is a kind of spiritual distress going on in that situation which nobody's really talking about. Um, and in particular, they did tell us that there were um, problems of, that are really still caused by the fragmentation of our system. That in fact, um, care is still delivered in episodes by specialized teams. And so because patients are moved from service to service, because teams rotate on and off, um, it's very easy, and, and there's multiple teams sometimes caring for a patient at the same time. It's very easy for a buck to be passed, for um, everybody to think the other person is addressing the personal and spiritual dimensions, um, or to just say, well, what can I do? I'm rotating off tomorrow anyway, and, so, and to let things go. And so that kind of fragmentation came up again and again as a systemic problem. And so uh, but they also told us that there were times people show us some continuity across the, that fragmentation. If there are ways people reach across it. Um, and one student telling us about an attending who, um, when, his, when the patients rotated off their floor and into, say, a rehab unit, would still send the medical student to go check on the patient for, uh, for several days afterward and report back to the team. And so there were, um, there, there were some good stories to go with that. But that they did tell us that there is, in fact, competency at this stuff. That there, there, they did tell, you know, when they told us about those role models, there were consistent things about how people engaged when they're doing a good job. Um, the other thing which I came across very clearly and repeatedly in paper after paper was how aware the medical students are of their own personal and professional development in going through this process in their third year. They're, they're acutely aware that they are changing as they go through this, that they are becoming more desensitized, that they see so many things every day in their, um, in their daily lives, in their, in their work life, um, that they no longer can react the, quite the way pe average people do to such tragic situations. Um, and at the same time, and they, and they realize that to some degree that's functional, that they need to do that. But they're also very worried of becoming too insensitive so that they become like some of the lesser role models that they see um, who, who pass the buck, who don't address any of these needs. And the fact that that, was, that came up over and over again struck us as, um, as a, bit, a bit of a surprise in this. That we weren't, you know, while educators often talk about this stuff, we weren't aware that students were that acutely self-aware of that process. And so under each of the, the four competencies that we prompted for, I'm going to I'm tell you a few of the themes that came up for each of those. Um, and very often, um, I, and when I say very often, I mean, again, we're not doing uh, quantitative stuff, but at least significantly often came up this idea that sometimes we still just don't address the fact that the patient's dying and therefore fail to meet their needs. And, and you could see this quote from this student. Um, the, the, telling us that the team stayed immersed in the immediate treatment issues. Not once did my team mention or consider that Ms. W was in the process of dying. I did not hear any talk about end-of-life care, so I didn't think it was necessary to talk about this with the family. 
I spent a lot of time with them answering questions. The patient's sister was very suspicious and felt like she was not getting the whole story. I don't think she did get the whole story either. And so sometimes medical students believe that the patient is dying, but because nobody's talking about it, actually doubt their own perception of that until the patient actually dies and then realizes nobody was addressing it. Um, under the, uh, we asked them to tell us about the uh, resources the team brought to the situation and, uh, and, and what kind of experience that uh, provided for them. And there were a couple of things that came up. Sometimes just the shock and suddenness of death for medical students. Um, uh, seasoned caregivers like yourselves uh, often expect a patient to die. For a medical student, sometimes it's quite surprising. And so a few of them talked about things like walking into their uh, patient's room in the morning, um, ready to greet the patient and seeing a stripped bed or something like that that suddenly starkly tells, uh, lets them know that the patient has passed away. Um, the, uh, the other theme that came up under this header was that quite often um, there is no processing of the fact that this death has suddenly occurred that the team simply doesn't mention it. We did hear some stories where teams did take a time out and talked at the nursing station for a moment, um, but, did, but more often than not, the norm was simply going on. Um, I didn't even get a chance to say goodbye to the family. Before I even realized what had happened, the family was gone. The patient removed from the list, and my next patient was waiting for me to take care of them. The team didn't make any comments about her death that morning, and everything seemed to continue and move on as if nothing had happened. I initially did not know what I wish had happened, but the way the situation ended lacked any closure for me. And again, this battle against desensitization um, uh, that, and the student's awareness of this. This is a student who uh, was working in the ER that day, um, and a patient is brought in in an emergent situation um, with a, a large uh, gunshot wound to the chest. The team is working furiously. The trauma surgeon comes in, a um, whole full court press being done. The patient dies, and the team moves out of the room. The med student's standing in the back. The nurse goes up to the body to begin prepping the body to, to remove and send it to the coroner. And she turns to the medical student and says, come here, I, I want to, it's time for an anatomy lesson. Let me show you what's going on here. And so the student is glad that he has this teacher who's taken her, um, him under her wing. But he, he reflects on that experience and he says, I kept seeing that scene over and over again in my mind. And I struggled to define my feelings toward the situation. The medical student side of me kept thinking, I'm so glad I got to see that. That was awesome to see everything I, I, I'm learning come together so quickly. But then the other half of my mind kept thinking, but that was a real human being that died in there. It was not awesome. It was horrible. And that kind of, I think that just very poignantly describes that struggle of which the medical student is aware. And similarly, uh, another student tells us, um, when I left the SICU, Ms. W was still alive. I hoped that she would make it. In my head, I pretended that is what would happen because I knew that once I started my next rotation, I was likely that I would never see Ms. W again. I was more or less able to wash my hands of the situation. I think that as residents and students, we have the ability to do this because of our ever-changing schedule. I know that it's necessary to be able to move on, but there's something so superficial about this that makes me sick. And so the, uh, again, that you could see in the desensitization how it works with that fragmentation of the system we talked about a little bit. The fact that one rotates on and off and rotates to different units enables one to simply go into denial if one chooses. And, and, and again, this, she realizes that can be healthy, but there's also something um, missing in that kind of thing if one simply moves on without talking about or processing any of these feelings. And of course, again, that, uh, that counterbalancing side, that they realize that they do need to become somewhat less sensitive to these situations. This is a, a student who was on um, his OB rotation. The uh, baby's being delivered. He's with the team uh, through the whole delivery. The baby is stillborn and, uh, and, and dead. And of course, the family um, begins to react emotionally to it. And, then, and the medical student also begins to react emotionally to it. And he says, I just couldn't hold my emotions anymore and began bawling. I've never felt so helpless in holding my emotions. The hospitalist that was in charge of us immediately grabbed me and took me to a quiet room so I could sit down. I was so thankful for him to listen to me cry uncontrollably and attempting to get a handle on what just happened. He told me to let it out, that it was okay. 
I'll never forget that day. Now again, we, we see here, as, as we want the, the students to remain sensitive and remain compassionate human beings, the medical students are realizing this doesn't work. If, if, I have, if I do this, it takes all the, um, uh, the attention off the patient and the family where it belongs. And so I've also got at the same time to get this under control. But uh, nevertheless, an, also a very poignant experience in which the, um, the attending on is uh, very compassionate in how he deals with the medical student at that time. And of course, ultimately, both have to be true, right? One has to become less sensitive, uh, but one wants to not become too insensate. And so this, this, the medical student who was looking at the gunshot wound at the top of, uh, that we looked at a little while ago, where they, it was saying it's awesome, but no, it's not awesome, it's horrible, um, continued to, to wrestle with that problem and said, at the end of the night, I had not found any sort of peace with the events I witnessed that day. I was still torn between siding with the medical student in me or the emotions of a human being. Finally, I realized that I did not have to pick sides. I could be and should be both. So at the end of the night, I simply ended my internal argument by praying. I prayed for Ms. P and his, Mr. P and his loved ones. I prayed for medical staff who care for these patients on a daily basis. And lastly, I prayed that throughout my career, no matter how many patients I see or deaths I encounter, I hope that I continue to face these questions and emotions so that I can help my own patients to die with the great deal of dignity and respect which we all deserve. And so um, it's interesting in that um, the reconciliation tries to hold both elements um, without letting go of either. And also that the, the, um, the student himself um, used a spiritual um, format in order to help achieve that reconciliation that the student's own spirituality was helpful in pulling that together by, by doing it in an act of prayer. When we asked the students, um, you know, what would, how will this experience impact your future care of patients, um, we expected um, fairly modest observations from them. Um, however, we came to call their response to that the pledge because they seemed to be taking a pledge from, to, to say, I will never do this, or I will never do that, or I will always do this, or always do that. Um, in fact, the title of our talk here, I will never let that be okay again, is a response to a situation that the student didn't think went well, and she would never let that be okay again. Um, and so they made commitments, essentially, and they, they seemed to be strong kinds of things, which. Um, speaks well for the, the idea of why we should do, continue to do reflection in medical school. That, if, uh, that when one draws a lesson from something, if one actually make, makes a performative act of will, it has some potential um, for affecting one's future development. And of course, that requires some support and reinforcement. But nevertheless, um, it seems like an excellent first step in doing this. Um, the most common pledge or commitment that we heard students make uh, was simply to remain aware of the, and sensitive to those needs of families. Again, holding on to that sensitivity um, and to not let those needs go unaddressed. And so the, the student told us, all I can do is take this experience and move forward by being there for others when the time comes. I will never let that be okay again. Namely, never let it be okay so that the family is, is going on thinking they're not getting the whole story because nobody's talking about death. Um, and the, but she will uh, from, go forward to address that. And so, um, so that, that timidity um, is, uh, is something the student takes a pledge to overcome. Um, one of the other uh, kinds of commitments we heard students make all the time was to be present, that they, they felt that, that if nothing else, they could give the, the gift of some of their time to d uh, dying patients and their families. And so one student tells us, in a few situations since the time described above, I've turned to the family and asked them if they'd like me to be present throughout the whole situation, and if, if I, it would offer them any comfort if they had my number and knew I would be there when the time came for the death of their loved ones. I've also turned to my residents and asked them to please let me know to call me when this time arises. So in some ways, compassionate presence becomes a literal physical presence in the, for the students. Um, the other pledge that became very common was uh, referral to pastoral care. And so it, it went, uh, one student told us, if I'm not available to be present with those grieving, I will make sure that other qualified people are, so, people, so these people are not alone. And so that referral became a, a common th theme. 
Um, they made a, a number of other commitments, improving at their skills at delivering bad news, uh, making hospice referrals, uh, to connect with the patients on an interpersonal level. Um, one student told us about an attending that um, he followed who, uh, when the patient was dying, he, he did address, frankly, the, um, the choices for the patient, but also spent time realizing that the patient, what, asking the patient what his interests were in life, and the patient was interested in the Civil War and stuff, and so he would come with daily with sort of little tidbits or common books that they read and discuss those kind of things. So making an interpersonal connection became a common theme as well. And um, they also offered commitments to ongoing reflection as a method to avoid that um, over-desensitization. And of course, to remembering the uniqueness of patients. Um, one student said to us, looking back on this experience many months later, I see how much that first experience with patient death has shaped my third year. Unfortunately, but predictably, I've had other patients this year who have passed away. Even in the moments when I've been really tired and just overwhelmed, I remember that Mr. A, that to someone, this is the loss of someone immensely important. And so the, um, holding on to that uniqueness and remembering that even though it, um, patients do come and go in the lives of caregivers. And so that's, that's pretty much the themes we saw um, illustrated in the students' own words. And I'd be happy to um, hear your thoughts or experiences or to answer any questions as, as I can. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very helpful. Um, can you tell us about any of the, the striking differences between um, the different responses? A lot of this were thematic similarities, but were there any outliers or real different uh, responses? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, and, and we did, this was a randomized study so that we had two thirds of the students randomized into doing this and, two, and one third did a different kind of ethics paper. Um, and so we, we wanted to make sure we had a representative group um, and truthfully, we, we did think that when we went into it, that there would be outliers, that there would be some students who just don't quite get it. And, um, you know, and that their reflections remained on a very shallow level. Um, there was nothing that seemed personally to touch them. But truthfully, out of 80-some papers, we didn't find anything like that. Um, it, was, uh, it, it was striking that way, that in, in some way, given this opportunity, um, every single paper gave us something that was kind of um, in line with, with these themes. Yeah, the, I, I believe it was 88 reflection papers that we ended up coding for the themes. Yeah, and that's, that's a great question. And, um, you know, as, as you know, uh, medical education and residency education are complex systems that are fairly hard to intervene in effectively. And so we, we don't have any particularly um, easy answers in terms of low-hanging fruit that we think we can, if we just do this, it'll really be helpful to them. Um, two thoughts we have had that um, we're, we're trying to push in the direction of. Um, one is some kind of a timeout at the death of a patient, you know, because that was a, a common thing that came up, that students who, who said that somebody acknowledged the patient's death seemed to have far more closure on it than students who said, we just moved on, nobody said a thing about it, we're on to the next patient. So um, our dean has become very interested in the idea of there being some kind of time out around the death of a patient, even if it's just for five minutes, the team stops, anybody have anything to say kind of thing. So that, that's one thing we, we, we were interested in piloting. Um, the other thing that we're starting to head down the direction of um, is making better use of pastoral care in the support of, uh, of our uh, medical students and residents. The, um, you know, we, we've been fortunate now in that um, our uh, pastoral care staff is, is fairly large at Loyola, and, um, and they are charting in EPIC, and they have a pretty um, intricate system in which they're able to chart, and through which other caregivers, such as nurses, and now we're starting to look at opening up to medical students, can actually enter something into the notes for a... Uh, um, for the pastoral care that alerts them that an intervention is needed for the patient or family members. And so if they detect spiritual distress, we can make that uh, referral much more um, effective and simple for them to do. Um, and the thought is that 
um, pastoral care would, would close the loop then with the student or resident. So to talk to them about, to thank them for having asked, uh, given them the referral and to just explain how they saw what happened and what they're doing to provide, because we think that may help the, the students rather than just going on to know that in fact they were somewhat effective. But if you have any thoughts, I, we would love to hear them. I mean, as you were listening to this, was there thoughts you had on how we might do better? Uh, and during that time, students are also going on their chaplain mentor rotations at Loyola. So, so there, there's a, um, we integrate that experience in a lot of ways, but you're right that that's, um, uh, th so there's a lot of formation going on there as per contrasted uh, prior to the, the uh, third year rotations. And, and you're right, it would be interesting to see how that, that experience contrasts with it. Right? Yeah, and uh, you know, we, we didn't collect anything like that. Um, you know, and, and there is, um, uh, uh, it's interesting as you're saying that because one of the things is every time we look at this, it feels almost like there's so much here we, we want to harvest more from it. You know? we, um, and it feels almost like dropping the ball not to get more from it. Um, but, but we uh, have not yet gone down any further road with that. We didn't get any, any further feedback from them. Yeah, and, and thank you for sharing that experience. Um, you know, I mean, clearly one of the interesting things about this is it is a lifelong process, right, for caregivers like yourselves, that um, there, you go through it, but then, and I was almost speaking a lot of times like it's finished at some point, but it's not. It, it, um, at, at, other, at certain moments, it comes back, you have an epiphany, there's a recommitment, a renewal, all kinds of things that happen. And I suspect that part of what many of you like about medical education is it gives you a chance to remember and look through the student's eyes and see things fresh again, and it, and it brings you back to that. Um, but, but it raises the question then, how do we support you through that um, lifelong process? And, um, and you know, and, yeah, and, uh, and I haven't specifically in, in reference to this study, but you raise a, a good point that um, as, you, as you distinguish there between modeling and mentoring, right? Modeling being something that the student sees that doesn't have to necessarily be a direct engagement, mentoring being where there is a direct um, relationship between the two. And it did seem that models are all over the place, right, in that third year, um, whereas mentors may be few. And, um, you know, and I don't have any particular answers as to how we make sure um, or that the students are expo all exposed to particularly good models, uh, role models. Um, it does seem to happen somewhat naturally through the system, right, that we, um, some people become recognized as really good clinical teachers and we try to put them in that, those roles, make them clerkship directors, reinforce them in that. But it, it doesn't seem to be um, particularly systematic in, in, in these kinds of terms. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm open to, to good suggestions on that. Mm -hmm. uh, say more. How, what do you think about it? Um, I think it can work. I think that what each individual learns may vary somewhat, but if it's demonstrated in a reasonable uh, and uh, practical way, that uh, you probably have a very good impact, at least in terms of getting the basics across to mm -hmm. an individual who is really good. Mm -hmm. Marshall. Thank you for sharing such a powerful stories. In one of your early slides, you mentioned six objectives of the overall project, of which two were excluded from this particular project. <coughs> Number five was uh, health system factors. And I've had this thought during your talk about like, the whole patient safety field, where uh, you know, the old analogy was, well, you know, if you just train the person better, well, we're gonna avoid a mistake, and, and you know, that's the way to do it. Um, and in some ways, uh, it, I thought that was the, the, the nature of the, the, your findings, that, that, that the students were aware that of like different issues that have come up, or from a teacher standpoint, um, issues that we would want to like, talk to students about and, and like Ed was saying, address in a teaching way. So clearly there's a role for that. But you also sort of raised how there's this, this whole set of system factors in terms of the transitions, for example, or a culture that makes it so it's not automatic that these, these issues are dealt with. So I'm wondering if, in retrospect, it would have been better to also somehow incorporate that fifth theme in the projects, because for lasting change, the thing about like end-of-life care, I mean, not a lot really has changed, it seems, in the past 20 years of the actual um, implementation of institutions. But it, maybe we'll talk about it more, but you know, these systemic problems and the lack of a cultural imperative 
uh, had made it difficult for change. And so I'm wondering if both from like, the learning perspective as well as for implementation and change, in starting to incorporate more of the system discussion explicitly would give us big gains. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that's an excellent point. And, and you're right that we, we meant to exclude it in the prompt, but in the end, that theme of fragmentation that came back is a system issue, right? And, that's, and that came back very strongly. Um, and so, yeah, asking it explicitly so that students might offer us um, some insight into what they think can help. Um, because it, it, when it did come up anecdotally, as I say, some students talked about um, attending, to sending them to check on patients that had rotated onto other services uh, that they'd moved along the continuum of care. But we didn't hear uh, uh, particularly uh, system, systematic answers to how to deal with some of that fragmentation. And as you say, partly it's because we didn't prompt for it. And so um, it, it is something that is worth asking their insights on in future iterations. But, but I, I took your point to be beyond that. Your point was that if this is a problem, uh, part, of the, part of the approach to finding a solution should not just be the personal mentoring or modeling, mm -hmm. but, but, but should also involve uh, more general system changes. Yeah, the ec excellent questions, and um, and I'm probably going to disappoint you a little bit in the answers to them. Um, the uh, uh, you know, other than knowing that the pledge came at the end of their reflection, you know, just where it came chronologically in it, as if everything they reflected on led to it, creates the impression that they may not have known what it was until they started writing. Um, but there's no way to really know that, right? A good writer can know where they're going before they, they get there. Um, so, and I, I don't know the literature on, um, on this kind of thing, because again, we, we, um, you know, we, we didn't study up on it expecting it. It came as a surprise, so now we have a chance post hoc to go back and look at it and look at this literature. So, so yeah, I, I, if people are, do know of, of literature on this kind of thing, I mean, I'd be interested to hear your take on it. Um, we'd love to look at it. And, um, and also, one of the thoughts is, whether we should seek to um, get their impression of, of, uh, of those pledges at some point um, down the road, you know, perhaps sometime after, uh, when they've, say, just finished residency or something like that, um, to um, send them their reflection and, um, and ask them about it, you know, perhaps um, e either through an interview process or some kind of survey thing, and just see, um, you know, how that is held up or if it's meaningful to them, if it's been reinterpreted, people, can integrate or reject these in a whole variety of ways, and, um, and it would be fascinating to kind of know more about that. What's your suspicions on that? Yeah, I, know, uh, I don't know. I, my guess is that they didn't really, they may not have come to the pledge until they wrote the essay, but that may not be the case. We don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, yeah, I think that there probably has to be some kind of, some kind of literature on this in other kinds of settings. Right. Yeah, and you know, and, and I, I do say that the, as we've read these things, we didn't set out to feel like a tremendous sense of responsibility towards these students for having asked them to write this, but that we ended up feeling that. And, and it does feel like there's these intense things being shared and, and um, potentially, as you say, game changers in their life happening. And we, did, we do feel a little bit short on, I'm not exactly sure what we should do for you at this point to help you with that. And, and so we are really open-minded towards um, additional possibilities here. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, a number of years ago, Elizabeth Kugler of Ross wrote a book on death and dying, the five stages that the patient goes through. And that we discussed with her, is that still being used, implemented, so that, you know, I have an idea with how the patient um, well, you know, we certainly aren't using it in any kind of um, uh, formal way. This, you know, we are thinking about it in terms of stages. And you know, my understanding of the literature on it is that 
um, they're still relevant, but people don't necessarily progress in a linear kind of fashion through, through these things. Um, but, but clearly, the same kinds of dynamics um, that she outlined, where, where people do um, uh, try to negotiate with death, try to um, deny it, try to do all sorts of things, and eventually come into some kind of resolution, um, you know, is, is um, a process that works with death and also with most kinds of formation, where people go through various things on their way to resolution. Um, you know, and, and I, that one student who um, comes to that moment of peace and prayer about those two aspects of their future, that the, the medical student scientist and the, um, and the human being side, you know, it kind of plays out a process. I, I'm, I'm hearing acceptance in that, you know, in, in a way. And, um, and so, the, so the kinds of dynamics that, that Kubler-Ross outlines are certainly relevant, but we're, we're not making formal use of them in any way. Probably. Uh, you know, that, well, that's a great question. Um, you know, what one in reading these essays is much more confident about their competence, uh, about their self and professional development than we had thought, right? That, that seemed to be the part that was coming across very clearly, that they knew where they were at, they knew where they wanted to go, and they were taking some responsibility for that. So that personal and professional development thing um, came across well. It's much harder to know how their experiences of, say, referring to chaplain, you know, simple patient care competence, make the referral when the patient needs the referral, um, whether in fact um, that was as well developed in students or, or not. And so this kind of um, reflective exercise doesn't necessarily give you that. And that is where there is a role for things like simulations or role plays or things. Um, as I, I was mentioning earlier, that um, introducing the, the med students in the future to how the chaplains do a spiritual assessment in the chart and, um, and has some signs that the chaplains look for when they, they would like a referral to them and becoming part of that kind of system um, would go a long way towards developing basic competencies that um, would give us more confidence that from the patient's perspective they're getting what they need than we're able to attain from a reflective exercise. When, when, you, when you hear these moving stories, uh, the, the quotations that you gave us from medically naive mm -hmm. uh, clinical students, mm -hmm. uh, it, it gives me pause to wonder w whether we're moving in the right direction, it's the direction we've been moving in for at least 100 years, to train these students for desensitization. Mm -hmm. that, that is, whether that is an appropriate or legitimate goal. Um, that is that the famous essay by Renee Fox about 40 years ago called Detached Concern, which looked at five or 10 different critical encounters beginning in the anatomy lab that medical students go through. And at each stage, the effort to sort of encourage the student to be concerned but detached mm -hmm. or desensitized to the experience. I, I wonder if, if we wouldn't do better by acknowledging human emotions mm -hmm. and recognizing that um, feeling and empathy and compassion, uh, sadness, mm -hmm. are, are legitimate things to have mm -hmm. um, when faced with death um, and, and not, not moving in that other direction. Mm -hmm. And have you had experience like this in your teaching? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've, I've tried. I've tried to say that, um, uh, that, that medicine is part of life and that uh, doctors are part of the community in which they practice, the community they serve, and that, um, and that feeling with your patients and their families is perfectly human and understandable and reasonable. I mean, I, I'm sure you can go too far on that. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's the way I try to teach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there is a difference being desensitized than to become insensitive. Nice. Good. We as physicians become desensitized after we see some of the things. But then, uh, in general, one does not lose its, its sensitivity. Mm -hmm. It doesn't become insensitive. And also, it is situational. Like I read in a journal that somebody did MRI and showing it to 
people, surgeons of blood, of MRI and showing blood, and the surgeon showed less on their brain uh, light up than other people did, and a conclusion as if, uh, of insensitivity, which I think is not true. Um, if I were to give you an example, say I have operated for 40 years, and I have built, um, you know, dealt with blood a lot in the operating room. But if someone's hand scratches here and it's the drop of blood, I become very uncomfortable um, because the situation is different. I become uncomfortable if you fall, and then I see some blood coming, I become just as uncomfortable. But as soon as I try to do something about it, put my hand on it or put a bandage, and even though you may say ouch or you may say something and I cannot, I may not even listen to your ouch. I could do what I am. But then afterward, I really, if you have pain, then it's different. So I think these emotional things are very difficult to conclude some major thing about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I couldn't have said it better. I, I think that um, uh, you, you did a nice uh, um, distinction in talking about situational uh, aspects of this, but in certain situations, um, one becomes sort of programmed to do it. Um, the other interesting thing you raised there is that um, there seems to be uh, a residual emotion. If, if you are programmed to um, keeping your emotions under wrap for, in certain situations, there is a residual to it that after the fact sometimes comes back, or as Tracy was pointing out, that perhaps sometimes unexpectedly will well up, and, and that's a sign that in fact those things or those emotions are still there. You're not insensitive but that in fact you, you've formed them in some way so that you're able to uh, execute certain behaviors. Um, so it is a fairly complex dynamic. Medical education and medical practice available uh, to, to a group who previously were not able to get educated and not able to get licensed. So, so th this, is a, this is a big change. Um, this is the immigrant population that Mark was the first in the country to work on. I'm told now that it's been picked up by a number of California schools and other schools uh, down in the southern tier. Um, but Loyola was the first school to do it. This was a lovely event, and thanks so much for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.